Hello you beautiful audience. This is Reddit Stories. And today's topic is. 3 Creepy Stories. Part 33. Story 1. I torture people by showing them a good time. I like to torture people by showing them a good time and take Louis for instance. I took Louis camping and hiking all around the world which he loved. I took him to some of the world's best places to hike and camp, and he will have such good memories of it. A time will come though when those good memories will torture him, like when he loses the ability to walk. He will be stuck inside with nothing to do except die away. Those great memories of hiking and camping will only make things worse for him, as he will crave those great times to come back and will make him hate his disabling condition even more. This is what I want. Then there is Lucy and she enjoys great dining and so I took her to the world best restaurants and she enjoyed it so much. The experience itself in these kinds of restaurants are a luxury and she will never forget them, and I don't want her to forget them. When she becomes stuck in a cave and days and weeks go by and starvation takes over, those amazing memories of great dining will only add to her suffering and make her more hungry. When she has to force herself to eat bugs and other disgusting crawl eyes, her memories of great dining will make her hate her situation even more. Those great memories will be torturing her and this is what I want. Then there is Punoi and he enjoys holiday resorts which activities like bike riding, swimming, yoga and other activities of similar vein. I took him to some of the best holiday resorts in the world and he was finally enjoying life. Punoi will surely suffer from this great memory because when he is stuck in a sunken ship, with water surrounding him with some space to breathe, those great memories will make him miss those times and make his situation even more unbearable. It will be torture and this is what I want. Then I tried showing Yuhavi a good time but he told me that good times and memories lead to more suffering when your life goes to crap, those good memories will only add more suffering to whichever detriment you are experiencing. If your life is always crap then you will always be used to it. What a wise person this Yuhavi is and denying my invitation to show him a good time. Story 2 I used to be a janitor for the dark web. I used to be a janitor for the dark web. Some people have a normal job, Monday through Friday, 40 hours a week, health benefits, bonuses each year, retirement funds, well not me, I don't have a normal job. It's not easy doing what I do, but it pays the bills since I can't get a regular job due to my criminal record. I'm a janitor that works for the dark web and I clean up murder rooms once the buyers are done torturing and killing the victims they paid for. I've been doing it for the past three years, every time someone needs help cleaning up the bloody mess they made, I go in and clean up the bloody remains. I make sure there is not a single drop of blood in the room and dispose of the leftover body parts any way I could. No evidence remaining, no questions asked. In fact I can never ask any questions, these people cannot be fucked with it. I just get paid to do my job and go home like nothing. It's a sick job but they would pay me very good but all that would change one night when I started to finally question my morality. It was one night when they called me to do a job, it's always at the same location which is 40 miles from where I live in a rundown warehouse. I was called to clean up a room which really was no problem at all but I noticed or barely caught onto something I never thought twice about. As I was cleaning the room that was covered in blood I saw a small picture on the floor, I picked it up and it was a picture of a little girl, probably around 14 years old. This made me think right away that this was probably the victim whose blood I was cleaning up just now. It gave me an uneasy feeling inside and for the first time kind of disturbed me just for the fact that these people are now using kids as their victims. But again this was a job where no questions are asked. I put the picture in my pants pocket and continued cleaning. Once I was done, I packed up my things and quickly got out of the warehouse. I went inside my car and instantly I got a call, it was them, they always call private. I answered and they asked me if I was done cleaning up, I told them yes and that I just gotten into my car. 
They then told me that they left the money inside my glove compartment while I was inside cleaning and they'll probably have another job for me in the next two days since they have a customer who's already waiting. I knew I shouldn't have done this but I decided to ask how old was she? Referring to the victim. They hanged up the call. I'm sure they were pissed just with me asking. I didn't know if I could continue doing these types of jobs anymore but I didn't know how else I would get out of this without some possible threat to my life. I got the picture of the little girl and put it resting on the passenger side, I went home that night contemplating everything. It was the next day around 9 o'clock at night when I got a private call, I knew it was them and I was tempted not to answer but I did anyway. They gave me the same location again and to be there around 4 o'clock am. This time, no questions asked. Juan Miguel Santos of 3905 North 16th Street. The call hung up. This was a clear threat, just do my job and get out of there, I would need to leave town the next morning and disappear after this. I arrived at the location and saw there was an old grand marquee parked outside. Usually there shouldn't be any cars but mine at the location and got worried that maybe these people are keeping a close eye on me. I stepped outside my car and walked slowly inside, feeling more and more paranoid with each step I took. The hallways were darker than before and I saw light come from the room I was supposed to go in. I entered inside and my eyes couldn't believe what they had just seen. There was a girl in the middle of the room tied up and gagged to a chair, alive. The job wasn't done yet but then I saw the body of a man laying right on the floor next to the girl, that looked to be around 16 years old. The girl began to scream at me and I started freaking out even more. I ran to the man on the floor and checked his pulse, he was gone. This was the man that was going to kill this girl since I saw a scalpel on his right hand. I walked myself outside into the hallway and immediately got a call, private, it was them. Is everything okay? They knew something was up, they also had cameras in the hallways but not in the rooms. They must have seen that I was nervous. Yes, everything's okay. Finish the job and get out, we'll leave the money in your car. They hanged up but I knew they knew something was wrong. I went back inside the room and the girl was yelling at me to help her with the gag in her mouth. I didn't know what to do. I needed to dispose of her body but that meant I needed to kill her first. I looked around inside the man's bag and he had several weapons and tools inside, presumably to use to torture the girl. I pulled out a power drill and turned it on, the girl started to scream even more, telling me to stop. She was crying her eyes out. I aimed the power drill at her face and more tears started to run down her face, I put the power drill down. I couldn't do it. I took off her gag and asked what had happened. She told me that the man just fell on the floor and seemed like he had a heart attack. You know that I can't let you out of here, these are dangerous people and there are cameras everywhere inside this building we both looked around the room. What about him? asked the girl. I looked at the man and saw he had a hoodie, I took it off and gave it to the girl. Put this on and cover yourself and run as far as you can away from here. I'm scared what if they find me. I looked inside the man's pockets and found some car keys, they must have been for the car that was parked outside. Here take these keys, I think the car that's parked outside belongs to him. Whatever you do, do not go to the police, they will find you and they will kill you. Just go as far away from here as possible before she left I asked for her name and she said it was Crystal and that she was 17 years old I was scared for her. I knew they might have even been outside waiting for me to finish. Before she stepped outside, I looked around the lot to see if it was clear for her to go. There were only but two cars outside and she quickly ran to the marquee, she said thank you and took off. I went back inside and quickly got my things, my phone started to ring, it was them, I ignored it and quickly ran to my vehicle. As soon as I was to take off, a car was approaching from behind me. The car parked right behind me and two men in masks stepped out, not only that but they opened the back seat of the car and took out Crystal. They caught her, they knew everything we had done. I should have taken off. 
one of men took out a gun and pointed it at me to step outside my vehicle. I stepped out and they wanted for me to go inside. They took me and Crystal into the room with the client's dead body. I knew what they were going to do to us, Crystal couldn't stop whining and moping, this is what happens when you try and be a hero. I needed to do something before we would be dead bodies right next to the one that's already on the floor. I saw that Crystal was right beside the switch to the lights, I looked at her and signaled my eyes to the switches to turn them off. The moment Crystal turned off the lights I ran towards one of the masked men, gunshots fired as the men were yelling to turn on the lights. I grabbed the power drill that was on the floor and drilled it right into the man's chest, I stuck the drill all the way in and didn't stop till I heard the man gurgling, choking from his own blood. I got off him and heard Crystal breathing hard and yelling, I turned on the lights and witnessed Crystal stabbing the other masked man repeatedly with a scalpel in the face. Half of his mask was gone from the punctures. I got Crystal and told her to stop, she was frightened, terrified. She hugged me tight and began to cry. Both of us had made it out alive this time. We walked over to my car and took off, both of us covered in blood. The sun was coming out as it was already 630 in the morning. We both needed to change our identities and I knew a guy who could it that I met from jail and drove over to his place right away. Sometimes I do think that maybe it would have been better off if both of us were dead, since we would now have to live in fear for the rest of our lives. Luckily I haven't heard or seen of anything but you never know, these people always manage to find you, let's hope they don't catch me now or for the rest of my life. Story 3 Over the Moon Chang Yi nearly fell, as she abruptly slid to a halt on the smoothly polished floor. She might have been proud of how well she kept her balance, were she not overwhelmed with abject terror. She had two thoughts battling for dominance in her head. The first, her safety. The second, betrayal. The one person she thought she could trust, in her alienage, turned out to be a monster and a pervert. Doing her best to stifle her crying, one hand still clasped firmly over her mouth, Chang Yi grasped the door handle with her free hand. Through sheer desperation and determination, she'd managed to squeeze and turn, despite the film of sweat coating her clammy hand. Ying Kang, the class heard from the exasperated foreign exchange student, as she burst through the door. She continued, but no one could tell what she was saying, let alone understand it. Realization washed over her, in a brief, but serene moment of clarity. She then burst into tears. Young lady, I'm teaching a class here. Mr. Lopez was the first to break the awkward tension. Chang Yi didn't register his bumbling. It wouldn't have made a difference even if she understood English. She hastily turned around, locked the door, and yanked the flimsy pull-down screen, before shutting off the light. Young lady. I don't know how things are done where you're from, but around here, interrupting a class with such a brazen and disrespectful display warrants a punishment. Mr. Lopez screeched, in the nasally agitated tone his students affectionately related to an ostrich's squawk. Chang Yi shuffled her way to the opposite side of the room, near the windows, as Mr. Lopez slowly felt his way through the darkened classroom to reach the light switch. Chang Yi put her hands on the window sill and the lights flashed back on. Mr. Lopez was ready to begin his litany of what a student should be, but something halted his thoughts dead in their tracks. As Mr. Lopez looked to the ground, ignoring the snickering of the small class students, he noticed an imperfect, fragmented footprint. Many of them, in fact. All leading from the door, to where the young Chinese exchange student was leaning halfway out the third floor window, looking down to discover that it was far too high to jump. All the footprints had the thick and unmistakable crimson of blood. A sharp twang from somewhere down the hallway could be heard. Chang Yi began to scream as quietly as she could to, turn the lights back off and hide, while Mr. Lopez took a deep breath, washed over by the calm found only in one who's seen much death in their life. Everyone, move all of your belongings to the back of the room. Mr. Lopez said, in a firm, yet calm voice, hitherto unknown to his students. 
Mr. Lopez, why? Martin O'Hare, possibly the only student hoping the geometry lesson would continue, tried to pipe up. Shut up, and do what I say. Mr. Lopez barked, in the same authoritative tone. There had been rumors that Mr. Lopez was once in the military, but his duties and rank changed depending on who you asked. The only person who knew for sure, was Mr. Lopez himself. All of the students had quietly begun their migration to the room's rear. For the first time in what felt like an eternity, Chang'e felt as though she could fight back the tears. There was hope. Every time she'd begun to tense up, Martin, holding her hand, would calmly repeat no, 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 it's okay. Martin continued to comfort Chang'e, while Mr. Lopez turned out the light, and joined the class in the back of the room. Chang'e was normally interested in listening to other people speak. She truly was enthusiastic about learning English, at first. Mr. Yin was an excellent teacher, and really sparked her passion. Until he didn't. She deeply regretted ever having accepted his private lessons. Despite her rudimentary grasp of the English language, she knew what Mr. Lopez was doing, as he spoke in a muffled tone into his cell phone. Mr. Lopez was on the phone with the police. How many? Mr. Lopez asked Chang'e, hand over the phone's receiver. She just stared blankly at him, unknowing. Christ, he sighed, as he held up an array of fingers, trying to demonstrate numbers, then shrugged to indicate a question. Not that it helped at all. Martin took a sheet of paper, and began to write something on it. Chang'e stared intently, unsure of what he was up to, but knew full well it had everything to do with her. Finished, Martin slid the paper on the floor in front of her, and pointed at the first figure. A single eye followed by a question mark. He then pointed at the second figure, two with a question mark. As he prepared to point to the third, she abruptly slammed her finger down on the first figure. So, it's just one man. Mr. Lopez dubiously whispered into the phone, before ending his call. In the dark silence of the classroom, a faint tapping could be heard from the hallway, gradually growing in volume. Footsteps. Mr. Lopez crept over to the cabinet in the corner, and fumbled delicately for something. A baseball bat. He slowly slipped across the room, and stood back against the wall, beside the door jamb. Beads of sweat trickled down his wrinkly, furrowed brow, stinging his eyes. The footsteps grew ever louder, until finally culminating into a crescendo of silence. It seemed obvious to everyone that whatever it was, stood just outside of the door. Mr. Lopez twisted his grip on the baseball bat, ready to swing. For the students of the class, every second felt like an hour. Every breath took an eternity. As Mr. Lopez slowly leaned forward, and gently nudged back the flap covering the window, there was a strange sound. Almost like a chirp. Mr. Lopez stood for a few more moments on the spot, before gently weaving back and forth, then collapsing. Almost as if on cue, the second his limp corpse hit the floor, the screams began. By the time the blood dripped out from the small hole just above his left eye, chaos had broken out in full. Students scrambled for any kind of sanctuary they could find. One clambered into the closet, desperately trying to shut it as another two tried to force their way in. Fingers were pinched, bones were broken. One fear-stricken student attempted to lower themselves as gracefully as they could, out the window, toward the ground. Chang'e saw them let go, but she'd never know if they survived the fall. The only two who remained relatively still, near the back of the classroom, were Chang'e and Martin. A disturbing sense of dread crossed both of them. The combination of impending doom, and the savagely base anarchy of their fellow students formed a shroud of surreal disbelief. Martin was in shock. Chang'e was past that, but she'd all but given up hope. She turned her head, and looked out the window, seeing the peculiar sight of a full moon in the mid-afternoon sky. I wish I was up there right now, away from all of this. Anywhere but here she thought to herself. 
The jangling of keys was only audible to the pair of ears on the outside of the pandemonic cacophony. Most of the students had ceased scrambling, and turned their attention back toward the door, in a morose curiosity. The door gently slid open, revealing the silhouette of Mr. Yin, the English teacher. Some students grew a false sense of security, believing him to be their savior, before they noticed the weapon in his hand. Others found it even more terrifying that someone they thought they knew, someone they trusted, could be behind such evil. Into your seats, children. No one sat. They all stared, bewildered. The room was quiet once more, aside from the weeping of two girls near the back. Let me make things a little more clear for you, Mr. Yin said, as he raised a sinister looking handgun with a long tube on the front to a boy's head and fired without hesitation, get in your fucking seats. Screams once more erupted, as Mr. Yin sighed and rolled his eyes. Some students scrambled to the nearest desk, as Mr. Yin fired at a few other students who couldn't contain their fear. Chang Yi and Martin were the only two left not dead, or seated at a desk. There were only a handful of students alive. Three, not including her and Martin, from what Chang Yi saw. Mr. Yin called the two wayward students to the front of the class. Visibly frustrated at the perceived closeness of Martin and Chang Yi, Yin separated the two of them. This child. Mr. Yin began, you'd choose this child over me. Despite not knowing what the words meant, she knew what he was saying. She knew where this was going. We should be together. You should never have run. You're the reason all these people have suffered. Mr. Yin reached a hand forward, and gently grazed Chang Yi's tear-stained cheek. He slowly, coyly slid his hand down her neck, toward her chest. You should have stayed with me. Martin saw his opportunity, and lunged for Mr. Yin's gun. Shots rang out, and the scuffle ended nearly as soon as it began. Martin O'Hare laid on the floor, bleeding profusely. The three remaining students had taken the opportunity to flee the gruesome scene, as soon as their former teacher was distracted. Nothing will come between us. I would wrestle the sun down for you, the lunatical teacher trailed off. As Mr. Yin began to appreciate Chang Yi's body with his creeping hands, he noticed a dark red spot on her blouse, slowly growing in size, and saturation. No, no, no. Chang Yi, for the first time since all of this began, felt no fear. In fact, she'd hardly felt more than a sharp prick, when the bullet penetrated her chest. She was drained. Too emotionally exhausted, too deep in the throes of her trauma. The only thing she felt was cold. She slowly fell, back against the wall, using what strength she could muster to keep herself sitting upright. What have I done to you? I'm so sorry, he cried out, as tears began to stream down his face. Approaching sirens could be heard in the distance, which caused manic thoughts to race through his head. He had his solution. If we can not be together in life, we shall find one another in death, he whispered, as he held her wrapped his hands around her head, and planted a soft kiss just under her hairline. Chang Yi looked up, locking eyes with Mr. Yin. The last thing he'd ever see. As he pulled the trigger, the chirp of the silenced weapon left a lasting ringing in Chang Yi's ears. The disgraced teacher fell to the floor gracelessly, with a thud. The cold began to grow, as Chang Yi looked about the room. Something caught her eye, something that twitched. Chang Yi, the young boy, clinging to his last desperate moments, croaked as he crawled toward her. No, 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 she said, as tears welled up in her eyes once more. It's me, it's Martin O'Hare, don't be scared. Chang Yi slowly reached forward to Martin. Hare, she said. The two dying youths held one another as tightly as their feeble, failing strengths could muster. Yeah. Hare, Martin said softly, as he drew his last breath. Chang Yi slowly slid from her seated position, her fight against gravity failing. She might have been proud of how long she'd held out, if she'd only survived. Abruptly, she lost the final battle, 
and fell limp to the floor. Her hair laid stone still in her lap. This marks the end of the video. If you like my content, consider subscribing as it helps me a lot. See you until next time.